Um, we're going to move on now to our next speaker, who is Frank. Frank McGuinness is a communist, barrister and trade unionist. He previously served as head of the legal department of the trade union United Voices of the World, and he co-founded that union's legal sector branch. His areas of legal expertise include employment law, industrial relations, public law, immigration and asylum, civil claims against police and other public authorities, housing law, criminal defence, inquests and international law. So welcome to our meeting, Frank. Um, and I'll now pass over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I've been asked to talk uh, for about eight to 10 minutes about workers' existing rights to organize, strike and picket, um, and then to provide some insight into the proposals to change these rights um, and the with an emphasis, particular emphasis on public sectors. So I'll give a brief description of the existing statutory regime and I'll explain the bill, the Strikes Minimum Services Levels Bill 2023. Um, and then I'll, I'll close by way of some uh, very brief analysis. Um, so I, I, I suppose I should start my description by talking about the two biggest pieces of legislation that we currently have on the books. Um, I should say employment law, industrial relations law, very complex, spread across lots of different um, statutes and regulations. But these are the two sort of things that jump out the most, perhaps. Um, so we have the Trade Union Act 2016, uh, relatively recent, um, and that made a number of changes that made it sort of more difficult to go on strike. Um, it introduced higher thresholds for success on industrial action ballots. It introduced a requirement for two weeks notice to be given to employers of industrial action, um, increased requirements for union supervision of picketing. Um, public sector organizations are required by that act to publish facility time details. Um, there was a requirement of opting in rather than opting out by union members to contribute to political funds um, and it increased the requirement for information to the certification officer among uh, several other changes. Those are some of the bright line changes. So that's the 2016 Act, but really what we need to talk about and what I think every socialist, anti-capitalist um, in operating in the so-called United Kingdom needs to be aware of is of course the 1992 Act, right? the Trade Union Labour Relations Consolidation Act 1992. Um, that act creates certain statutory immunities. I think the starting point is to say, and I'll come to this in the analysis, but that act is um, no friend of the working class, right? It's a consolidation of that right class relations. And it creates, uh, it, it does create certain things that workers can use, but it's by no means, by no means a, a piece of pro-worker legislation, right? And that act, what it does create is certain statutory immunities. And that's been the case for some time. Um, the, the right to go on strike was hard fought over um, over really hundreds of years. And um, before these statutory immunities were introduced, if you went on strike, you were in breach of contract and you could also be um, held liable for certain criminal sanctions as well. Right. So the, the obvious thing was that if you tried to go on strike, you got fired. And then through the course of the ebb and flow of industrial relations, the 1992 Act consolidates um, certain statutory immunities, which means in practice that if a trade union complies with the very complex balloting provisions of the 1992 Act, then uh, that union and its members will, will be immune, hence statutory immunities, right? Immune from certain civil actions in contract and tort, as well as from certain criminal consequences of going on strike. Now, the most obvious, um, the most obvious sort of legal consequence of going on strike is that it's a repudiatory breach of your contract of employment, right? If you don't show up to work and your contract of employment requires you to, then you're you've, you've um, committed a repudiatory breach of the contract and normally you can be fired. And so the 92 Act says, no, you can't be fired. You're immune from, um, from being uh, dismissed for that reason. Um, so uh, if you were sacked under the current regime, if you were sacked, you could sue for unfair dismissal and it would be automatically unfair. And so you could to your employer, even if you hadn't worked for them for two years. Many, many on the call will be aware that your right not to be unfairly dismissed normally only accrues after two years length of service. That doesn't apply in the case of dismissal for trade union um, uh, for, for taking uh, a protected industrial action. All right. So that's the current that's the current uh, legislative regime. A very, very quick summary of the, uh, the 92 Act, which is a complex act. 
but for our purposes, that's what we need to understand, right? It creates certain immunities. Now, this minimum services bill will grant the government powers to set minimum service levels for six key public services. Um, those are uh, health, fire and rescue, education, transport, decommissioning of nuclear installations and management of radioactive waste and spent fuel and border security. Uh, the bill's had its third reading in the House of Commons. It's in the committee stage of the House of Lords. Um, I, I don't see any reason to believe that it won't pass. There's no, obviously no parliamentary opposition to it. Um, the long title is a bill to make provision about minimum service levels in connection with the taking by trade unions of strike action relating to certain services. And the primary effect is quite a short act. And the pr primary effect is to amend the 92 Act. Right. So we're back to sort of uh, modifying what remains the core, the spine of industrial relations in this country. And the, um, the, it's worth noting the Act will extend to England, Wales and Scotland, but not to the six counties. And I've not had a chance to check um, if there's any proposals to modify industrial relations in the occupied north of Ireland. Um, there's no detail on the limits of these service levels. Um, the power to set the level is given to the government who may introduce legislation that imposes the restrictions without agreement with unions who represent the key workers affected. Um, and based on these levels, the government intends to force some people who voted for strike action to go into work on strike days. I, I think it's difficult to overstate how damaging that would be to uh, trade unions' ability to take effective strike action. Um, so the, one of the primary effects of the bill will be to hand a new strike-breaking tool to employers, these so-called uh, work notices. So if work in any one of these six listed public services if, if, the, if the workers in any of those industries have voted for industrial action, the employer would have the right to serve on the union a work notice specifying the number of people required to work and the work to be performed during the strike in order to meet the minimum service level. Uh, so it sort of completely defeats the whole point of a strike, really. Um, and uh, the, the employer will be required to send those notices seven days before the strike action takes place. That can be shortened to four in days in some circumstances. Um, once the note, the work notice is served on the union, uh, the union will be mandated to take reasonable steps to ensure all union members comply with the notice. No one knows what that's going to mean in practice. The bill's very vague, has no detail about it. Um, and it, the bill says that the union can be sued if the employer believes it is not taken, the union is not taking these reasonable steps. So ultimately, the, the union is kind of being co-opted into forcing its members to break its own strike. Um, now, as I've said, the bill also removes protection for striking workers. So if a, if a work notice requires that an employee works during a strike, they could be sacked if they refused, which is to say they could lose their statutory immunity from being um, dismissed. That's because the bill removes key protections from individual workers exercising their rights to strike. And so effectively, frontline workers will face dismissal for taking part in lawful industrial action. <laughs> So, so much for the description. I'm conscious of time. I'll very briefly say a few words about analysis. I think the first thing for, um, for us to understand is that the 92 Act is the legislative consolidation of Thatcher's government's victory over striking miners. Now, obviously, the miner strike happened in 1984 to 85, and it was a show of strength by one of the most, if not the most militant unions in the country. And that union was violently smashed um, by militarized police forces that were sent in from around the country right so Thatcher's government understood that it needed to win a massive victory with the uh, most militant section of the the British working class and you know tragically enough uh, she her government won that victory hmm. uh, so that's 84 85 and then the 92 act is as I say the consolidation of that victory so in in my, in my analysis we need to we need to think about the I mean first of all there's an irony to neoliberalism preaching deregulation yet imposing these uh, these industrial relations that create hyper regulation of the labor supply and make it very very difficult for trade unions to go on strike right there's all this bureaucracy that stops workers from easily taking industrial action um so there's a there's an obvious hypocrisy to the neoliberal uh, um uh, class relations uh, but more importantly i think to overturn that set of class relations if we want to think seriously about strategy for overturning that act and the class relations it consolidates i don't think we can think in legislative or legalistic terms what's needed in my view is a workers movement powerful enough to wage a struggle on the level of the 1984 85 minor strike and to win that struggle and it's only when you win uh, in the realm of the economic struggle that there will necessarily be a kind of legislative consolidation victory a kind of reversal of the defeats of thatcherism and in some ways uh, it seems as though Corbynism put the cart of political struggle ahead of the uh, ho uh, horse of economic struggle, if I can put it that way.
the sort of standard cart before the horse metaphor. No, no um, you know, obviously critical support for Corbynism, but I think uh, that um, in some ways the level of political organisation was was far advanced as compared to the economic struggle. And so now it falls to us to try and kind of pivot towards economic struggle. Um, I also think we need to think deeply about the role of legal challenges, the limited role of legal challenges. Um, any strategy that gives a central role to law is, in my view, doomed to failure. We have Article 11 of the European Convention of Human Rights consolidated into um, English law through the Human Rights Act. Uh, but that's historically proven very limited when it comes to attempting to enforce workers' rights at strike. And the European Court of Human Rights has been very reticent to impose any real restrictions on the um, British industrial um, relations statutory regime. And uh, the European Court tends to bestow a very wide margin of appreciation on national government. Um, I also think it's worth thinking about certain anti-capitalist traditions would say that, um, you know, police officers, prison officers aren't um, they're, they're sort of workers in blue, right? They're class traitors that don't merit solidarity. And that's a divisive question on the left. Uh, mm. The fact that border guards is contained, are contained and uh, affected by this bill means that any serious strategy for opposing it needs to, needs to take a view on, um, on whether um, border guards who are administering a highly racist and violent border regime deserve solidarity from the workers movement or if we have to have some principal stance uh, in opposition to them. Um, I think Diane Abbott said, quote, the Tory anti-union bill is a dagger pointed at the labour movement, end quote. Um, that's one way of framing it, but I think that that downplays the role of the 92 Act. It is, it is important to state that this Act is a very serious attack on workers' rights, but it's also important to state that um, the 92 Act is the, the main spine of relations and that this Act is merely continuing to modify uh, a, a very anti-worker um, set of uh, trade union legislation. I'm conscious of time. I think I should draw it to a close just with one final thought which is that um, I read a briefing by Unison, and again, you know, um, Unison bureaucracy is not as militant or, or as radical as I might want it to be, but it's a very useful briefing, and I, I learned a lot from reading it. Um, but again, I think it's important to interrogate their framing, which I'm going to quote from. So they say in the framing, quote, for decades, the 1992 Trade Union and Labour Relations Consolidation Act has protected trade unions and employees if strikes are called, ensuring that employers can't penalise workers who break their contracts of employment to take industrial action, end quote. Now, in my view, I understand that it's just a passing sentence, but that's a very dubious framing. The idea that the 1992 Act protects workers, it's true in some strict legal sense, but as I've sought to show, it is in reality the consolidation of um, Thatcher's government's violent victory over the working class of this country. And it's only by um, contributing to the, the re-emergence of a militant uh, trade union movement that is willing to break the law that we're going to win a victory on the level of the defeat we suffered in the 80s um, and so my closing thought is that this legislation is going to make it more difficult to go on strike but it's always been the case that it's possible to take strike action that's not covered by the existing immunities and we need to think seriously about what it would mean to um, to revive the sort of level, the level of militancy that the NUM exhibited, where you had a situation, for example, where the mm. High Court was imposing injunctions saying, if you go on strike, you'll be in breach of the statutory regime and we'll sequester your assets. And the NUM sort of said, right, well, we'll deal in cash then. Like, you can't stop us. We're too, we're too militant. We're too powerful. We need to reach that level of militancy. That's the, it's the only way. Um, so those are my thoughts. Thank you very much for um, giving me some space to explore them with you. Thank you very much, Frank. Very, very thought provoking. There, it's interesting that six counties are missed from the legislation. Your your issue about border staff is is also an important one that that needs to be considered, uh, and the idea that 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 we need to tackle this politically rather than legally. It'd be interesting to know whether we've got contributions later, including perhaps from Ian on whether we can go back to. Um, how the NUM fought its battle, um, or whether we think that the landscape has changed forever. So thank you very much for that contribution, Frank, and um, we'll come back to you later.